<clears throat> Greetings and welcome. We are in Senior English A, and our objective now is to begin our study, analysis, exegesis of Shakespeare's classic, Macbeth. Our goal is to today get through Act 1, Scene 1, Scene 2. Before we get there, though, let's take some early notes to make sure that you understand how we will read this play. So if you're taking notes, that's the way that you want to head it. How to study Shakespeare. Now, the first thing I need to remind you of is what I said in the earlier lecture, the introduction to Shakespeare. Shakespeare assumed you would watch his plays, not read his plays. But then Shakespeare didn't write his plays for you. He wrote his plays for people living in roughly 1600. Got me? We today enjoy watching Shakespeare's plays, but when we want to study the play, we will take an approach that includes reading the play. We will call it annotating the play. As we read, we take some notes. We will be served with some professional actors who are performing the play on audio, not video. You're not going to watch it. You're going to listen. And while you listen, you're going to follow and read. The objective is that somewhere by the second act, you will grow more comfortable with reading alone the literature, the language, the syntax, the rhythms of the speech. And you'll kind of begin to be able to figure out what's going on. As uh, we get closer to the end of Macbeth, you'll pick up the play Hamlet and you'll begin to hopefully read it on your own, practicing as well. You should have your own copy of Hamlet already in your possession. As we read, I will be making observations regarding the play Macbeth and the major themes. We will spend a lot of time at 2A to speak in terms of our annotative language, themes, messages. So right away we'll begin to do this project of kind of pointing out the ways in which Shakespeare is trying to again reach two audiences. What are they? Write them down before we say them. What are the two audiences of Shakespeare? He's writing for that audience that stands on the ground in front of the stage. We call them quite literally the groundlings, yes. They are there to hear spectacle, to see spectacle, to hear uh, you know, gutter language and comedy and that kind of thing. And they like good fights, they like blood and guts and all of that. And then there's that second audience we mentioned. Who was that second audience? Do you remember what we call them? They're the thinking audience. That's the philosophic audience. They're the audience that wants to try to learn something from these plays. Or we might say it this way. The thinking audience enjoys the questions of life asked and sometimes answered. We'll, we'll pick up with this when we hit these themes right away. Uh, and we'll do it pretty quickly right away. Now again, just to remind. We want to point out the ways in which Shakespeare is able to enjoin, please, both audiences, the thinking audience and the audience of the groundlings who enjoy spectacle and the light. He can do it simultaneously, and we'll see it right away in the very first act, very first scene. But I need to pause for one more moment, and I need to remind you why we're here. You will notice I do this repeatedly, because you don't have very many more days as a senior, and so I want to remind you why we're here. I'm very pleased that by the end of our conversation, you'll know something about this play, Macbeth, and Shakespeare. I'm happy about that. But that is not first and foremost why we're here. The primary reason we're here is I'm teaching you how to read. Because if you are going on to the next level at the university, you must be able to read on your own. That is to say, look at a text and begin to understand what that text says, whether it's in biology, whether it's in psychology, whether it's in history, doesn't matter. You're going to have to read textbooks. I'm helping you. So I'll try to model it as we go through what we call a closed C-L-O-S-E, a closed reading of this play. In other words, we'll pretty much read together all the lines of this play. And I'll begin to demonstrate to you the ways that you can read at multiple levels. We'll do it right away, actually, 
with the very first act and the very first scene. Now, let's get a few things out of the way in terms of logistics before we go to this work. One, Shakespeare writes plays in five acts. All of his plays are divided up into five acts. He will divide those acts up into scenes. When you write about Shakespeare plays, you will always want to then provide the act, the scene, and the line number. Got me? So in other words, if I talk about Macbeth 2, 1, 13 to 15, I'm talking about Macbeth, act 2, scene 1, lines 13 through 15. So in other words, we can use a quick nomenclature here where I can say Macbeth 1, 1, which means what? What does Macbeth 1 1 mean? Act 1, scene 1. If I say Macbeth 1 1 7 8, I'm talking about lines 7 and 8 of the first scene of the first act. Got me? Second thing, this is important. In Shakespeare's plays, he loves to let the audience know what some of the characters are thinking. Now, in movies, you can do this easily by literally having the actor standing there, mouth's not moving, but you can hear his voice or her voice, and you immediately know, oh, that's code language for that's what she's thinking. In Shakespeare, he does something a little bit different. He has the aside and the soliloquy. Now, let's define both of these real quickly because we're going to see them in this play, and they will factor major. The aside and the soliloquy. By the way, the word soliloquy is spelled beginning S-O-L, which means one or alone, a soliloquy and an aside. We want to make sure that we understand both of those. Now, in both cases, we'll talk about, first of all, the way they're similar. In both cases, the aside and the soliloquy are when a character speaks for the audience to hear. Nobody on stage is supposed to hear what the, is said in a soliloquy and an aside. Got me? The difference between the soliloquy and the aside is simple. The aside is spoken when other people are on stage. But they're going to pretend like they don't hear what is being said. Okay? And in Shakespeare's folio, he will bracket with parentheses the word aside to tell you that what's being said is something the audience will hear, but the guys on stage will pretend like they're not hearing. That will allow the audience, again, to understand what the character is thinking. We're going to see the importance of this aside right away. The soliloquy is simple. No one else on stage, one person speaking out loud, so the only ones hearing, obviously the audience. We're going to see a number of these soliloquies as well, not only in the play Macbeth, but also in the play Hamlet. All right? All right, with that in mind now, I think we've got enough introduction. Let's turn now to Act 1, Scene 1, and we're going to pay particularly close attention to the ways in which Shakespeare will try to enjoin both audiences. That is to say, both the thinking audience as well as the ground ones. First of all, let's get right out of the way. Let's get our setting. Where are we? The play opens where? I mean, you got that freaky picture on 343, right? But right away, where are we? Does anyone have a sense where we are? Somewhere in Scotland. We are in a country named Scotland, that's true. Be more specific. Where are we? We are in the Badlands. See, I can use that term, and you know what that term means. We are in the middle of nowhere, the Badlands. What time of the day? What time of the day? It is the middle of the night. It is the middle of the night. Enter three witches. Now, the thing about witches and what they're supposed to look like, Shakespeare invents in many ways this idea that witches are these women who mix, you know, some kind of pot, mix some kind of uh, brew or spell, casting spells, 
And so we're going to see these three witches right away. Later, Banquil will say about these three women, I would call you women except for your beards. In other words, it's his way to say there's something wrong with you. You're not a normal woman, and they're not. These, these witches are going to play an interesting role in our play. They will come together, and they will speak for the first time, and then they will finish. Two things let's point out real quickly as we get ready to listen to this scene. One is we should point out that this is a scene very brief. Shakespeare is trying to elicit a type of feeling. For those of you that saw this play last fall for the first time in your life, you can maybe remember that's the way the play opened. And I love to go to performances of Macbeth and sit and watch, as I did even last fall, and watch to see how students who have no experience with this play, they're like, dude, all I care about is we got out of school. I don't really care. And they're sitting there, and all of a sudden the opening scene happens, and then there's this weird kind of thing that went across this group as I watched it when we watched this play last fall. Like, whoa, whoa, what are we looking at, right? I don't know, for those of you who remember, there were some strange masks that those actresses had on, remember, as they came out onto the stage, listen to the way that our, uh, our professional readers here play the same game, all right? Here we go, Macbeth, one, one. Because uh, even students who are completely convinced they hate Shakespeare and they don't want to watch a performance of Shakespeare, especially a live performance, they cannot help but be somehow attracted to this. Even if they say it's stupid, it's still kind of freaky to watch this performance. Physically, iconically to watch it. When you have a good acting troupe, they can do some really wacky things with the way these women are going to look. Shakespeare, I told you, is kind of the first Steve Spielberg. So he's going to do all kinds of special effects. So he's going to bring these witches up through a trap door right into the, uh, in, onto the stage of the Globe Theater where he will have these three witches. And let's now pay attention to what it is that they say. The very first, notice, always in Shakespeare plays, Romeo, you don't see until later into the act, first act. Othello, you won't see until later into the first act. King Lear, you won't see until the second scene. You're not going to see Macbeth in scene one either. Instead, dude, I'm here to see a play called Macbeth, but the first thing I see are three witches who ask, their very first question is, when shall we three meet again? When are we going to get back together? They're already mixing a spell. When shall we get back together? Notice, when... The hurly-burly's done. Shakespeare will invent this word. He invented a lot of words. Hurly-burly means what? What's a hurly-burly? Yeah, the turmoil of the war, the fighting. When the hurly-burly's done, when the battles... Look at it closely. Now all of a sudden you become a scholar and a thinker as you're looking at this. When the battles lost and won. Yeah, now that's interesting right away. Make the observation 
We normally would not use the word and, the conjunction here. We would use the word or, wouldn't we? We normally think about the battle as being fought from one side. This side either wins or it loses. Let's point out right away, this is going to be a play of paradoxes. Now, what does that mean? What is a paradox? When two things don't what? Don't fit together very well, right? A paradox. Notice here, when the battles lost and won. What, is, what does that mean, but lost and won? Well, one side's going to win, which means what? The other side's going to lose, right? So they say, as soon as the battle's over, we're going to get back together. Look at the next one. That will be air set of sun. By the end of the day, in other words, the battle's going to be resolved. Where the place upon the heath, there to meet with Macbeth. And for the first time then, we get his name mentioned. We know this is going to be a play about a guy named Macbeth. And the witches are the ones that mention his name. And they say, we're going to meet with Macbeth. Now, let's just point out right away, that is not good news. You don't want to be met by witches, okay? Because witches usually are understood as something not so good, but kind of bad. Then they will finish with a couple of observations regarding uh, the putting together of spells and the like, as you can kind of see there in your side note. The notion of toads or frogs always seem to somehow be a part of which culture Shakespeare really, you know, kind of making this popular, popularizing this idea. And then finally, all of them start dancing around the fire and the cauldron, and they start chanting together something really interesting. Look at it. And of course, these are lines for sure you're going to write down in your, in your annotations, because they will become some of the important lines of our play. Fair is foul, and foul is fair. Hover through the fog and filthy air. Now, wait a minute. If I tell you that the word fair here has, of course, two meanings. If somebody says, she's not playing fair, that means what? She's what? Cheating. Cheating, right? We know the word fair has that meaning. But the other meaning of the word fair is good or beautiful. Foul means what? Of course, we know the term in baseball to mean, of course, a hit that does not count. But what does foul here mean? It means bad or evil. So interestingly, look at what, look at what they chant. Good is bad, and bad is good. What? Good is bad, and bad is good? Dude, we define good as being that which is not bad. Agreed? And we define bad as that which is not good. This is going to be a play. You, you'll want to write this down. I'm giving you already a hint for what's about to come. This is going to be a play where things that often appear good are actually bad. And things that often appear bad, foul, are actually good. Look at the second part of their little chant. Hover through the fog and filthy air. This is a play where it's really hard to see. Now, I don't mean that you're watching the play and you can't see because of bad lighting. What I mean is, rather, this is a play where it's hard to figure out often what's going on. Hover through the fog and filthy air. If you're trying to drive through fog like the fog we had the other morning, Remember, you couldn't see very well, could you? You knew there was something kind of there, it's kind of fuzzy, but you weren't completely clear. Let's point out, this is a play where characters in the play and the audience itself will sometimes struggle to know exactly what's going on. Are you ready for this? Until it's too late. Until it's too late. Lots and lots of aha moments are going to happen in this play, but they're going to happen when it's too late. And so these witches will chant this, fair is foul and foul is fair, hover through the fog and filthy air. Good performances of this play will leave what kind of mood? I mean, our readers on our tape try and do a job of this, but if you're watching it, it's far more profound. Jot down in your notes, what kind of a mood is Shakespeare shooting for? How would you qualify it? What adjective, Mr. Lang, would you give to it? What 
I mean, what's, what, how are you supposed to feel if you're the audience watching these three witches, ugly, disgusting, scary witches come out and dance around the fire? Middle of the night. It's scary. Keep going. Startling, uncertain. It can shock, it can shock an audience. I, in fact, I watched, when you guys watched this, a good number of your colleagues watching this performance, and that was the first thing that came out onto the stage and then I just kind of sat and watched the group, as I often will do when I watch high school students watch Shakespeare. And they went from, what is this about, to, whoa, whoa, whoa. That, this is kind of weird. This is kind of, really? You know? At, but right away, there's going to be a sense something's up. Now, if you're paying close attention to the language, let's go to one, two. If you're paying close attention to the language, you know that there's a hurly-burly. There's a war. Got me? Now, let me help you understand a little what's going on so it'll make more sense. We've got Scotland. It is run by a great king, for your notes, named Duncan. Duncan is a great king, but he's an old man. We're in the middle of a fight. Here's why. Duncan, the king of Scotland, has had a traitor who has betrayed him. And onto the stage will come a wounded soldier. His guts are coming out of his stomach because he's been wounded. Shakespeare will literally give this guy the appearance of his guts. He's literally holding his guts in his hand as he comes onto the stage. He is dying. But before he dies, or before he goes to the doctor, he must report to the king what happened. He will be told simply this. In the middle of the battle, the Scottish troops were about to lose when all of a sudden two mighty warriors stepped up. They fought back to back to protect each other. Their names, Macbeth and who? Macbeth's best friend, Banquo. Banquo. Macbeth and Banquo, we're told. We're told that Macbeth, are you ready for this? Sorry if this grosses you out. We're told that Macbeth is such a great warrior that when he came face to face with the guy, the bad guy, he cut him with his sword, from his groin to his gullet. He pulled out all of his insides, he took off his head, and stuck it on top of a stick. That's what we're told Macbeth did. The response by Duncan is not the look on the face of a number of you like, whoa, whoa, whoa. Uh, that's not M Duncan's response is, oh, worthy gentleman. That's what Duncan says about Macbeth. He calls him a gentleman. Now, right away, let's point out, Shakespeare's wanting us to know we're in a different time. We're in a time in Scottish history when you were a gentleman, not because you wore nice clothes and you had lots of money, you were a gentleman because you were a great and mighty warrior. The fighters were the best gentlemen. Got me? And Macbeth, we're told, is the greatest fighter. He can fight so well that he can completely destroy his enemy by cutting him from his belly button to his throat and pulling out all his entrails and taking off his head. You got me? We are then told Macbeth and, and Banquiel are the reason Duncan has won the war. Act 1, scene 2. Let's now listen to that one. Follow along. Seemed him from his groin to his gut is the way we'll be told it happened. What bloody man is that? He can report as seemeth by his plight of the revolts, the newest state. This is the sergeant who, like a good and hardy soldier, fought against my captivity. Hail, brave friend. Say to the king the knowledge of the boy as thou didst leave. Doubtful it stood, as two spent swimmers that do king together and choke their heart. The merciless MacDonald. Worthy to be a rebel, for to that the multiplying villainies of nature do swarm upon him. From the western isles of Kearns and Gallowglass it is supplied, and fortune on his damned quarrel smiling showed like a rebel's horde. But all's too weak for brave Macbeth. Well, he deserves that name, disdaining fortune from brandished steel which smote with bloody execution. Like Vellus minion, carved out his passage till he faced the slave. 
Watch the house of cans, nor bade farewell to him, till he unseamed him from the nave to the chops, and fixed his head upon our battlements. Oh, so valiant cousin worthy gentleman! As whence the sun gives his reflection, shipwrecking storms and direful thunders break, so from that spring whence comfort seemed to come, discomfort swells. Mark, King of Scotland, Mark. Listen, Mark, listen. When that justice had with valor arms compelled these skipping terms to thrust their heels. But the Norwegian lord, surveying vantage with furbished arms and new supplies of men, began a fresh assault. Dismayed, not this our captains, but better than what? Yeah, it's a sparrow's eagles or the hair of the lion. They're not afraid. I must report they were as cannons overcharged with double cracks, so they doubly redoubled strokes upon the foe. Except they meant to bathe in reeking wounds or memorize another Golgoth, her I cannot tell. But I am faint, my gashes cry for help. So well thy words become thee as thy wounds, they smack of honor both. Go oh, get him, surgeons. Who comes here? The worthy Cain of Ross. What a haste looks through his eyes. So should he look that seems to speak things strange? God save the king! Which gives thou, worthy pain from five, great king, where the Norwegian banners flood the sky and fan our people cold. Norway himself, with terrible numbers, assisted by that most disloyal traitor, the Thane of Cawdor, began a dismal conflict. Till that Bologna's bridegroom, lapped in proof, confronted him with self-comparisons, point against point, rebellious arm against arm, curbing his lavish spirit, and to conclude, the victory fell on us. Great happiness! That now, Sueno, the Norway's king, craves composition. Nor would we deign him burial of his men till he dispersed at St. Cone's inch ten thousand dollars for our general use. No more that pain of Cawdor shall deceive our bosom interest. Go pronounce his present death. And with his former title, greet Macbeth. I'll see it done. What he has lost, noble Macbeth has won. We got some politics involved here you gotta jot down in your notes. The King of Scotland, Duncan, old man, has to fight against Norway, his close enemy, because the Thane of Caldor, who is kind of second in command to Duncan, has betrayed him. He is... The first time the word is used in our play, a traitor, a traitor. Now, when we're talking about a traitor, we're talking about an individual that has sold out his country, okay? He has, if you will, deceived the king, I suppose is a good way to say it. This is going to be a play about deception. This is going to be a play about deceiving. This is going to be a play about traitors. Right from the start, we're told of it. When you hear the word Thane, just think soldier. That's all it means. Caldor will be the kind of uh, title that he has, okay? By the way, notice for your notes, here, this information is provided by a second messenger named Ross. Every time Ross comes onto the stage to deliver information as a messenger, he's going to give important observations. This is true throughout the entire play. Ross will say, the Thane of Cawdor, your second in command, King Duncan, has been caught. Duncan says, we're jacking him. We're jacking him. He's, he's getting jacked. But at the very end of 1-2, we're told something good happens out of something bad. Fair is foul and foul is fair. The Thane of Cawdor title, second in command to the throne, if you will, is now given to Macbeth. Where is Macbeth, though? Macbeth is on the battlefield still. Macbeth is on the battlefield still. He will be told here in a little bit, you have been awarded this major prize, Thane of Cawdor, which is including title, but also some bank as well. In other words, just like in our... Remember our poem, Beowulf? I'm making a 3A observation here, aren't I? Remember our poem, Beowulf, you're a great king if you're a ring bestower. That is to say, if you're gratuitous or you're, um, you know, you show gratitude by giving things to your warriors, all right? So Duncan is going to say to Macbeth, way to go. Now I'm going to give you this, uh, this really good title, 
Thane of Kaldor. We haven't met Macbeth yet. We're through one and two. Notice three. We'll begin one three. We'll pick up here tomorrow, but I just want to set you up. We'll begin one three by meeting again the witches and then for the first time meeting Macbeth. And when he comes onto the stage for the very first time, we always want to pay attention to the first thing that the major character of a Shakespeare play says. The very first lines are always crucial, always important. All right? So we'll come back tomorrow and we'll continue. Now.